Our second speaker is uh, Holly Menninger. She's a microbiome explorer at North Carolina State University, and she's not afraid to get her hands dirty. An entomologist by training, Holly leads citizen science projects and science communications at Your Wildlife. Their participatory projects examine the microscopic frontiers in our everyday environment, from skin to homes to backyards and neighborhoods. Their project, Wildlife of Your Home, has invited hundreds of participants, one in six of which is a member of the PGP, to collect and return microbial samples from surfaces of their homes. So here's Holly. Thank you. Hi. How's everybody doing today? All right. Well, so as Madeline said, I direct a public science program called Your Wildlife, and we're interested in, in engaging the public in appreciating and exploring the biodiversity in their daily lives, whether that's the microbes that live in their belly button, we were those people, uh, or the, the arthropods in their homes and their backyards. The, the project that I'd like to talk to you about today is called Wildlife of Our Homes. And our goal with this project is to make a map of microbial diversity in homes across North America. We want to know who lives there, uh, who, what species, where they live, and more importantly, we want to understand the underlying factors that may explain why we find microbes in certain places and not in others. We are curious about how the design and the architecture of a home may influence the microbes that live there. We're interested in how the, the occupants of the house, whether they be human, uh, non-human, uh, plant, animal, uh, affect the distribution of microbes within homes. And then we're also interested at the much larger scale thinking about how, how larger scale factors like landscape and climate and geography affect the distribution of microbes within the homes. And we do this all by, by sampling common surfaces um, and then looking at the, the 16S, our DNA. So to, to do this project, we've, and, and in the spirit of the theme of this session, which is on explorers, I thought I'd make a, a Lewis and Clark reference. This is their, one of their, their maps from their expedition. We've made our own sort of core of discovery, if you will. So we've brought together ecologists, microbiologists, bioinformaticians, a lot of people from Rob Knight's group. Uh, we have building engineers, and we have science communicators like myself to, to develop this large-scale citizen science project. Our Lewis and Clark, if you will, are uh, Rob Dunn at North Carolina State University and Noah Fear at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And of course, we can't forget um, the, the, the most important people on our core of discovery, which are our citizen scientists. And to date, we received samples from over 1,200 different households all across North America. It's been really gratifying as the person in charge of, of science communication to, to have people tweet at us and, and, and talk to us on Facebook about receiving their kits, and they're so excited to look and under, understand more about the microbes inside their homes, like this young man. All right, so today I'm gonna to talk to you about some, actually some data, which we're really excited about. Last year I gave a presentation, I was just talking big picture. So today I'm gonna to be sharing with you some of the, uh, the results from our first analyses, which were based on 40 homes that we sampled in the Raleigh-Durham area of North Carolina. And this is work that will be forthcoming, it's in press right now at, at PLOS One. And for this study, we had 40 homes and we looked at nine standardized locations inside the homes. Uh, those being the, let's see, let's make sure I'm in, in order here, the, the kitchen counter, the, uh, a cutting board, we had the refrigerator, toilet seat, pillowcase, television screen, doorknob, and an interior door frame, so inside the house and an exterior door frame, one facing the environment. So now we're going to show you some data. The, the first thing that, that, uh, that we notice is that the, the amount of diversity or the richness of taxa varied among habitats across all 40 of these homes. And so on the y-axis, we have the OTU richness, or think about that as the, the average number of phylotypes per thousand reads per sample per habitat. Um, and, we have, uh, and we have those, uh, the median richness, or mean richness by habitat type. And you'll notice that, that there's variation there. We tend to define that the the locations within the home that were probably most infrequently cleaned, think about that being the top of the door trim inside the house, the exterior door trim and the television screen. Maybe some of you wipe your screens all the time. We don't in my household. Uh, those tended to have higher tax of richness in those particular habitats. 
not only did the number of taxa per habitat differ uh, among the homes, but that we found very uh, distinct differences in the composition of the microbes in these different habitats. And so I'll try to walk you through this graph. This is a pr principal coordinates plot that's showing you the variation among habitats and among homes. Each dot represents a specific habitat within, a, within an individual home, and those dots are color-coded by habitat. So you'll see that some of these dots uh, cluster together. So the blue dots are, are bluish purple dots are the more depositional habitats. Those are the places, oh, I have a pointer too, don't I? Does it work? Ooh, here we go. Uh, the more depositional habitats, that, uh, so those tend to be more similar. The dots that are closer together re, re, are habitats that have uh, microbial compositions that are more similar. Uh, the pinkish reddish dots are, are are uh, like things like the pillowcase and the toilet seat and the doorknob, those are things that are frequently touched. And then of course we have the green dots which are all representative of habitats with, with inside the homes. Um, within an individual, within homes, we found that the, the variation among the different habitats was much greater than the variation that we saw among all 40 homes for a particular habitat. So composition differs by habitat. We also took a source tracking approach because we were interested in what were the sources of those microbes that we were finding on the surfaces of the home. And so uh, for this particular uh this analysis, if you look, we're going to be comparing the relative contribution or abundance of, of sources across the different sites. Red indicate, red to pink, are the warmer colors, indicate uh, locations or sites within the home that have a higher abundance of that particular source of taxa. Um, blue are those that, that are, um, have much lower abundances. Um, if we look particularly for the, the human sources, both human skin microbes, human oral cavity microbes, human still, we'll notice that our homes have a strong signature of the people that live inside those homes. We have a, an imprint on, on the microbes living in our homes. Our, we're sharing our, our microbiome is moving back and forth um, from our bodies to the surfaces of our homes. I mentioned that there was some variation among the homes that, that among individual sites, among sites let me back up and say this clearly. We found uh, the variation for a given site among homes to vary. So there's some difference, there's some variation there among those, uh, those 40 homes. And we wanted to explain what, uh, what, might, what factors might, might explain those differences that we did see among homes. You know, you notice that the, the different habitats weren't all clustered on top of each other. There was some, there was some spread there. And um, we found, we looked at a number of factors that were reported by, uh, self-reported by our participants. Things like the number of occupants, the number of children in the home, the regular use of pesticides, the presence of carpet in those homes. None of those factors had any explanatory power. It couldn't explain much of the variation that we saw among homes. The only factor that we were able, uh, that had a significant effect or significantly explained the variation among homes was the presence of dogs. And we saw that effect of dogs both on, on surfaces that we, uh, that dogs likely come in contact with, that being, whoops, let's go back. The pillowcase, the pink dots are representative of the pillowcase, and so uh, the, the filled in pink dots represent um, homes with dogs, the white represent those without pets. Um, we also saw the signature of dogs on television screens, something that your dog probably doesn't come much in, in, in contact with, but perhaps some of those microbes were, were around in, in the aerosols. Uh, we found for a handful of taxa, and this relates to some of the, the new work that Rob Knight's group has, has recently um, put out, the relative abundance of a handful of those taxa were much higher uh, in homes with dogs for both the television screens, the purple, as well as the pillowcase, the pink. And we know that those are microbes that are found in much greater abundance on dog fur compared to human skin. And so we, can, we, we, we think that... Uh, when you're bringing in dogs into your home, you're not just bringing the pet and that unconditional love of your pet, you're also bringing their microbes. So we're really excited. That was just the first 40 homes that, uh, whose data we've analyzed. We now have samples from over 1,200 participants from all across North America. The purple dots are our, 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 our broad public participants, and the orange dots, um, which you all might find exciting, are PGP participants who have uh, collected samples. And I know a handful of you out there uh, still have samples. We've sent you kits, and you haven't returned those. And we would like those back soon, please. 
I mentioned uh, about looking at, we're trying to explain some of the factors that explain the, the distribution of, of microbial species within homes, but we're also interested in how the, the microbes that are in our homes feed back and affect our health and well-being. And so with this much larger set data set, we're hoping to, to understand some, some more about that particular link. We're also thinking about evolution. We are, uh, with, with, with sponsorship from the Sloan Foundation and from Nescent, which is a National Evolutionary Synthesis Center, we're hosting a working group where we're bringing together microbiologists, ecologists, we're actually also bringing in some entomologists, people like me, some archeologists, anthropologists, uh, uh, let's see, who else, historians, uh, all, all kinds of people that might think about sort of the home environment and the evolution of the home environment over the last 100,000 years. Um, we're interested in questions about how does the design of our homes affect the evolution of the species within our homes? How, has it, how have the, the communities of microbes changed since humans have, have built, been building home environments? And so um, we have already have, if you go to our website, yourwildlife.org, uh, there's a few blog posts already up related to some of the topics that are gonna be discussed at this working group and and we'll be we'll sharing those results and tweeting those and sharing them on Wiki in a very public way. So we hope you tune in June 10th through, through 14th. Along those lines, uh, I said that we're interested in sort of comparing the microbial communities that, that we see in homes today, particularly in Western homes, to sort of more ancestral conditions. And we were lucky to uh, be approached by Jeff Leach, who was involved with the American Gut Project. You may have, have heard of him. And he asked if he could take some of our kits with him to Namibia to sample the homes of the Himba, a pastoral group of people um, in, in, in Manibia. And we said, absolutely, because uh, their homes and structures are built of, of, of soil and of dung. Um, they're surrounded and in very close contact with, uh, with domesticated animals. That, that Their homes, they're certainly not the ancestral condition of human homes, but they're more closely like the ancestral condition of, of human homes than what we find in our Western homes today that are often closed off from the environment. Um, some, place, some people's homes don't even have windows that open in terms of the big apartment buildings. So we're really curious at looking at what mo microbes are finding in those homes and the amount of variation among the different sort of uh, habitats within that particular home. And hot off the presses, like literally last Friday, uh, we had our collaborator Noah Fierce send us some data uh, that came back from the Himba homes compared to a small set, it was 12 homes uh, from, from the United States. The, the really uh, interesting things about, about these, these preliminary results is that the Himba homes were incredibly diverse in terms of their microbes. So the absolute number of, of different taxa of microbes was much higher than what we see in Western homes. Um, they were more diverse, so there were so the different different both the abundance of, of microbes and the amount of richness was much higher. I think the most interesting thing to point out is the amount of variation oops, among habitats within their homes. Much less variation among habitats than we typically see in Western homes. So this is a story that in and of itself is evolving. Stay tuned. We'll be talking about uh, this more in the coming weeks and months. Uh, I gave out about 50 kits for sampling the wildlife or homes to PGP participants yesterday, uh, and we're looking forward to getting those back because we'd like to send about those 1,200 samples that we have, 1,200 times four samples that we have in the freezer right now, would like to ship those off for sequencing. So this is my plea. Please send in your kits. We want to include you in, in, in our study. We're eager to, to look at this much larger data set and ask ask them those, those bigger scale questions, particularly things about how climate and landscape influence the microbial communities within our homes. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, the folks that have sponsored our, our projects. Uh, those, uh, the Sloan Foundation has a program for microbes of the built environment, and they've been very generous with funding, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, and the Personal Genome Project that's made your participation possible in our project. And I'd be happy to entertain questions. Thank you. Oh, maybe you have to go to the microphone. Somebody in the back. Yeah. We'll um, hi, this was like incredibly cool. Uh, uh, my name is Belen Hurley. I work in the uh, NIH. Uh -huh. And I don't know what would be the value from a research point of view. Fr from an educational point of view, it would be amazing if you could do something similar, um, sampling the diversity in schools. Oh, right. Um, you know, engage children in citizen science. Uh, one day, everybody goes out, sample the school, take a census of who is here send the samples, and then compare your school with other schools across the country. Yeah, I think it, will, it will be really, really engaging and will teach so many things to the kids. 
<laughs> yeah, we've certainly found with our uh, belly button microbiome project that uh, that's really captivated the fascination of students and teachers alike, and we're building educator resources for uh, the educators to, to implement those sort of projects in their classroom. I think you're absolutely right with, with comparing the schools. I know that there has been some actual research looking at uh, Jessica Green's group at the University of Oregon has looked at microbes on the surfaces within academic buildings, so in the college setting. But to bring that to elementary schools and middle schools and high schools would be a really great opportunity. So thank you for that suggestion. Quick question. Um, the field of confidentiality and privacy issues, ethics in general, mm -hmm. with regard to the human genome has obviously well, been well plowed. Uh, what about the microbiome, how do you go about this with regard to informed consent? And specifically, how did you address that with your work in the African tribal nations? Right, so we had, um, we, we spoke extensively with Jeff when we sent uh, the kits with him and they had a, he had a translator traveling with him um, and that explained our procedure. Um, those samples came back anonymous. I don't, I don't know the, the individuals there and we, we have received IRB approval for, for our, our project. Uh, we maintain the, uh, the confidentiality of the, of the participants. Maybe you have an additional question there. Yeah, just, just a quick comment. What about the whole issue of bioprospecting around this? Are the nations that are you know, concerned, uh, is there any kind of feedback or consideration that you're giving to that? Uh, I, that's, that's a great question. I, I will say that uh, those of us that are doing work on the microbiome, that's been part of, part of the conversation. We haven't received any, any pu pushback, but that, that should be part of our considerations and part of the question. I think people uh, who are doing sort of citizen micro, microbiome ty type work, have uh, that's been on their minds lately. In the last few months, there's been a lot of discussion um, after the U-Biome project. Um, I don't know if you've seen some of the, the discussion online with concerns about their consent process and their human subjects review board. Uh, you, you can check that out online. But um, our community is tracking and we're, we're, we're working together on, on sorting out these ethical issues and working in conjunction with our um, respective sort of institutions at our, at our universities. Thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if you could comment on, you mentioned pesticides. Uh -huh. Did you also check what the use of antibacterials, in other words, cleaning, you know, and even individual soaps and things like that. And my second question is, um, are you interested in looking at this in places like hospitals um, and those who work in hospitals? Mm -hmm. the, great questions. Uh, we did ask uh, that the first 40 homes we looked at were really the start of our study, and so we were refining our, our, our data collection process in terms of asking questions. Um, we did ask people about uh, the use of antibacterial soaps in their kitchens and in their bathrooms. Uh, that was not, for our smaller data set, that, that was not a, a significant factor in explaining the variation among homes. Uh, we continue to ask that question and ask more specific questions about the use of cleaning products and personal care products in the home related to antibacterial. And so we expect with a much larger data set, we will have the power to, to hopefully detect some, some dif possibly detect differences uh, in, in, in those homes. And I, the second part of your question, hospitals, right. So people have, uh, other groups have, have looked at, at uh, hospitals and particularly in the context of uh, the ventilation into rooms in hospitals and how that affects the, the microbiome living on surfaces. Uh, in, in those particular rooms. And I, um, I think that might be related to Jessica Green's work again, her team, uh, but uh, the, some of that work has been out there. We haven't explored that, but there are people within our larger community who are asking those types of questions. Any more? Yeah. Um, you spoke about dogs. Uh-huh. What about other pets like cats and lizards? And Great question. Uh, for our, that, that data set whose results I presented, those were 40 homes. Uh, we had a lot of people who had dogs with no other pets, and so uh, we looked for cats, but there's only, I think, two or three homes that had cats and no dogs. Again, with that much larger data set, we will hopefully be able to look at the effects of other pets. And we ask people specifically how many of each kind, not just dogs, cats, birds, fish, lizards, guinea pigs, hamsters, um, all kinds of animals that live inside their home. And then we also ask about the animals that people People may interact with closely outside their home, chickens, goats, cattle, uh, et cetera, llamas. That was fun coming up with that list for the, the questionnaire of all possible uh, permutations of, of animals outside homes. So I guess we can have one more question. You, you asked, you described that the big difference was dogs, but then you went into this long riff on how babies change over time. 
Do the households with babies look different from the households without babies? Are babies less significant than dogs? This question was asked yesterday in a different way. Uh, okay, uh, that's a great question. Um, so we, uh, again, we ask about the, the participants, uh, the, the number of participants in each age group range. And so with that larger data set, hopefully we'll be able to ask, ask that question and see if there's differences by ha between having uh, babies and, and only, only adults in the home. Great question. Okay. Thank you all. I appreciate it. I'll be around for the, the rest of the morning. And so at the break, uh, please come up. I'd love to chat further about our project. Thank you. Thank you, Holly.